Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kayvon Kazemi. Uh, I'm the project executive for Alexic Group, the developer of uh, 56 Leonard Street. Uh, is this not working? Sorry. Okay. Um, with this site, we had the distinct opportunity to alter the skyline of New York not something that can be taken lightly. And so we interviewed several of the leading architects around the world to determine who is best suited for this task. Our final selection was Herzog and Demuron, and they sure delivered. Uh, once the design was completed, we then had to find the right construction manager, as this was no ordinary building to build. We partnered up with Len Lease, as they seemed to be the best choice to accomplish this task. However, once they started, I was very disappointed when I found out that this was not how they were going to build it. <laughs> Especially after all the time we put in to uh, come up with this rendering. What you're watching on the screen is a rendered video with which we introduced and marketed the building to the public. 56 Leonard is located in Tribeca, a residential area of Manhattan with no super tall buildings. Because of the unique zoning rights attached to this lot, we were not limited by a height restriction. And so it was known from the start that we would build a very tall tower with open views on all sides. Herzog de Muron wanted to, uh, something different than the monotonous, repetitive tall buildings that we find throughout New York City and the world with the new modern high-rise towers. And at the same time, they wanted to create distinctive individual apartments within the building. And so they designed the building from the inside out as the apartments would be all about the views. And by shifting and twisting floor slabs and creating cantilevers, the final design created a building where no two floor plates are the same and only five out of the 146 apartments are repeated. The second clip that you're now watching was created to sell one of the last remaining penthouses. I found it very refreshing that the final product that you see now on the screen turned out even better than the renderings you saw in the previous clip. Usually it's the other way around with today's rendering capabilities. Those familiar with Herzog's work know that they insist the materials used in their designs to be natural as is, especially the concrete. They use architectural concrete, untouched, out of the form, for the exposed concave slab edges, interior columns, and the walls and ceilings in public areas, all of which created different degrees of difficulties in the construction process, as once the forms were stripped from the concrete, the, the concrete couldn't be touched or tied into to utilize for the typical construction means and methods, such as crane and hoist ties. Herzog's design pushes to the limit the simple and familiar local methods of construction. It is at the very edge of what is structurally possible. After all, there are hundreds of buildings with cantilevers, just not many buildings that have hundreds of cantilevers. So the task of figuring, figuring out how to pour all these cantilevers, hundreds of feet in the air with nothing underneath them, fell to land lease and their subcontractors. Not an easy task. And I will let Jerry Bianco talk about that in a second. Before I do, in closing, I would like to say that it took tremendous effort from all the team members, design and construction, to build what is now an iconic building that has been the talk of the general public, the architectural, engineering, and the construction world. Thank you. Jerry? Thank you, Kayvon. So he gets all the pretty pictures, and I talk about the hard stuff, how we built this thing. So 56 Leonard at a glance. The building comprises over half a million square feet of reinforced concrete. 57 stories, 820 feet tall, and it's not exactly straight. In fact, there are massive cantilevers in the first seven floors and the last 10 floors of up to 25 feet. Additionally, there are 266 balconies randomly placed throughout the building and 13 outdoor terraces. For Len Lease, safety is our first and utmost priority. We plan each of our projects with 100% passive protection to prevent the fall of personnel or materials at the perimeter of the building. This means we look to provide leading edge protection, most typically through the use of screens or cocoons, in advance of workers installing the false work required to construct the building. 
Bearing this mandate in mind, planning for this particular building was not easy and posed particular challenges. Not only did the many cantilevers and balconies, which for the most part do not stack one on the other, make the implementation of perimeter screens difficult, it was compounded by the high standard being set for the quality of the architecturally exposed concrete of the slab edges, interior columns, and soffits. Now I'll walk you through how we safely plan and executed this one-of-a-kind project. The podium comprises the first seven floors of the building. These floors include the building lobby, a small area of retail space, a parking garage, on the second floor accessed by a car lift, elevator, two floors of apartments, mechanical rooms, and two floors of amenity spaces, including a theater, a pool, and outdoor terrace. The slab heights vary from 18 to 20 feet, and the seventh floor slab cantilevers 20 feet to the west and 15 feet to the south over the adjacent New York Law School. Given the irregularity of the slab edges from floor to floor, using a conventional perimeter screen was not possible as the slab edges did not stack one over the other in almost all instances. The concrete contractor addressed the leading edge protection by modifying standard 10K shoring towers used to frame the high slabs with screens attached to them. In this manner, they were able to modify simple towers they were comfortable using to create the leading edge protection required from them. The screens were supported below the framing floor and cantilevered above the working deck. The cantilever portions of the seventh floor were constructed using temporary 60 foot long W40 by 297 rolled sections supported on W40 by 397 girders. The sections were picked into place with the crane and positioned such that they could be rolled out and cut up at a later time after the cantilever achieved full strength. These bridge section members created a 300 pound per square foot hard barrier over the adjacent buildings, which allowed the deck to be formed, rebar placed, and ultimately concrete poured without vacating the upper floors of the law school below. The cantilevers are the green areas beneath the reinforcing steel on the right, and I'll talk a little bit more about that particular plastic in the forming later for the architecture exposed concrete. Zones one through five make up floors eight through 31, and 34 through 45. In this particular building, these floors comprise our typical floor construction. The most sensible screen placement was to be outboard of the furthest balcony on each elevation and any floor. When placing the screens in this fashion, however, the shoes or supports at the slab edges became very long and developed massive temporary loads, uh, which were untenable for the building to accommodate. It was for this reason we temporarily decoupled the balconies brought the screens as tight to the building as possible and constructed the balconies as a comeback after deck construction moved forward. The screens for the typical floors were approximately 52 feet tall, ranging in width from 12 to 23 feet. There were roughly 21 screens per floor, along with lifting platforms below the screens. We also had some stationary nets in areas where we knew the geometry forced us to reposition the screens. The balconies themselves uh, created a, re required a lot of effort for on the pre-planning for the comeback operation. Given the seemingly random placement of the balconies, coupled with the differing sizes, all 266 balconies were classified into seven different types, and specific procedures were developed for each type. We investigated making the balconies out of precast concrete and installing them with the crane, but multiple issues ranging from waterproofing, joint placement, connection details, as well as the desire to cast the balcony slabs similar to the exposed slab edges adjacent to them rendered precasted feasible. We looked at utilizing a system of tables or pre-manufactured forms raised into place to construct the balconies, but the building geometry, as well as the need to access the underside of the architecturally exposed soffit under the balcony, made this impractical. For these reasons, the concrete contractor utilized more traditional means to construct the balconies. in the slot. Sorry, bear with me one minute. There we go. Um, this drawing shows one type of balcony. This particular balcony rests partially on a balcony one floor below and partially on a table also on the floor below. The balcony on a lower floor upon which the balcony is framed is a different type that was constructed completely off of balcony two floors below and this shows the shoring still in place after the balcony below was stripped. The drawing illustrates the construction utilizing a combination of shoring towers, stationary nets below, and typical lumber form and railings, all of which the concrete contractor was very comfortable using. 
This shows, so, uh, shows several types of uh, balconies in different phases of construction. All of the black netting conceals shoring towers founded on either a balcony below or else a starter table extending from the slab below. Nets are deployed from the lower balconies in order to provide protection beyond the limits of the balcony being constructed above. Each piece of lumber, scaffolding, or tools were tethered back to a column during the construction of the false work. In this manner, it became impossible for the workers to lose a piece of lumber, tools, or the shoring towers themselves. Additionally, the drawings I showed earlier for each type of balcony were reviewed with the crews assigned to constructing the balconies. These crews were solely dedicated to this task until it was to complete to ensure no mistakes were made by someone unfamiliar with this activity. The 32nd and 46th floors contain outriggers and belt walls, which engage the exterior columns with the central core and provide stiffness to resist wind and seismic forces. The 46th floor was also used as a foundation of sorts for the very different floor plates of Zone 7, where all columns were picked up and transferred. In addition to providing stiffness for the building, these floors house mechanical equipment as well as elevator machine rooms. To construct these walls, a concrete contractor removed the screens and installed working platforms around the outside. These platforms served as perimeter protection, work areas for the installation and removal of formwork, and material staging areas. The 46th floor platform was also incorporated into the forming of, for Zone 7. This aerial shot taken from the crane shows the massive amount of reinforcing steel and formwork required to construct a network of outrigger walls which ultimately comprised the mechanical rooms of the 32nd floor. There were approximately 100 tons of reinforcing steel in the 30 inch walls on this floor alone, coupled with 250 cubic yards of high strength concrete. Last but not least, we arrive at the infamous zone seven. As mentioned before, this top 200 feet of the building houses 10 floors of 20 foot slab heights within huge cantilevers in just about every direction. Under no circumstance would any conventional screen system be able to be installed without being rendered immediately obsolete by the changing geometry. So a cantilever platform with a stacking perimeter protection screen system was designed. The system rested on tables on the 46th and 47th floors. The 46th floor table was necessary to pick up loads from above where there was no structure on the 47th floor to found upon as well as to transfer loads into the belt truss walls. Keep doing that. The stacking screens ascended to encapsulate the entirety of the top of the building. In several instances, they needed to be repositioned to enclose the structure. These screens and the formwork they enclosed were required to remain until the top floor achieved full strength at 56 days. During this time, the concrete contractors stripped and cleaned out the floors prior to dismantling the system for what came next, the big reveal. As the screens were removed, we exposed the structure spanning in multiple directions over a 200-foot expanse, 800 feet in the air. It was breathtaking and awe-inspiring. Eight balconies that were left out due to the false work associated with the tables on the 46th floor still had to be constructed. The concrete contractor assembled the same men that built the other 258 balconies and completed them without incident. So as if the complexities with, involved with constructing the structure without incident wasn't challenging enough, it was further complicated by the architecturally exposed concrete details. The slab edge of each deck required custom formwork constructed of elastomeric urethane to achieve the concave look of the design. In order to provide a finish acceptable to the architect, cold joints were not permitted. For this reason, the deck and slab edge, which extended just over six inches above the deck, had to be poured monolithically with the balance of the slab. Once begun, concrete placement continued until the deck was complete. Also, since the slab edge is integral with the deck, it was constructed using a hung form on the backside. Particular care was required to vibrate the concrete to ensure no excessive honeycombing or segregation of materials occurred during the pour prior to stripping. The exposed soffits, as you see on the underside of the second floor there, um, throughout the building under terraces, balconies, and the ceiling of the lobby here, and the amenity spaces were, were intended to have a random wavy look that we called elephant skin. That's that green plastic you saw on the bottom of the cantilever over the law school in the previous slide. This was achieved by placing heavy plastic sheets of formwork on the former prior to pouring. The round columns throughout the building had special forms to ensure a smooth finish. In all three elements, the design intent was for the concrete to be placed and stripped and untouched. An actual concrete look intended was achieved. 
The same level of care was necessary when constructing the architecturally exposed concrete elements in the amenity floors on six and seven. These include ex exposed ceilings, beams, columns, and most notably the pill-shaped amenity stair from six to seven. We spent five months with our concrete contractor doing mock-ups and samples to get the proper formwork, design mix, and placement method for the stair, which is the centerpiece of the amenity space. Similar to the exposed slab edges, cold joints were not permissible. For this reason, the 30 cubic yards of concrete required to construct this stair were poured in one continuous lift over 12 hours. The structure was built in just under three years. During this time, 1.5 million man hours were expended placing over 45,000 cubic yards of concrete and over 5,000 tons of reinforcing steel. The job totaled 2.3 million man hours. The video makes it look easy. We hope we did justice in explaining the true complexities that made 56 Leonard one of the most unique and identifiable new projects in New York City, a city that is no shortage of new projects to contend with. Thank you.